Scarborough folks, and welcome back to another episode of the uh, Scarborough Dudes Museum Basement Bar. Um, I got something special today that uh, I, I have funny feelings about sharing with you because it's going to um, dig into my past a little bit, but uh, that's okay. I mean, uh, I can always change my mind and not share it with you. It's this. This is, I'll give you a nice close-up there, my hash pipe that uh, I got in Europe. It's quite unique. And I'll first of all say that uh, all my friends knew this pipe very well. All my Montreal friends back in the days when we were living in Lachine. Uh, all of us in our parents' basements where we smoked hashish. Uh, we didn't do pot in Montreal. It was, number one, it smelled too much, but it just wasn't available the same way. If we were in Montreal, because of the harbor and the way it came in from the Middle East, was uh, hashish, especially hash from Lebanon. So um, we're going back, I guess, starting 67, right up to about 72 when we left uh, Montreal and headed off to Vancouver. Now, I did a trip to uh, Europe, in 1969, I set off with a backpack, hitchhiked uh, all around. I got a 99 ticket, $99 ticket on Air France outside from Montreal to Paris. You got on, they gave you a little package of uh, Jutin cigarettes and uh, some champagne. It was a pretty sweet deal. And then you just looked for uh, cheap places to stay. I stayed in the, uh, oh, cafes in the, you know, the Latin Quarter. Uh, I had a book, it was Eric Fromm's Europe on $5 a day, and believe it or not, I lived on $5 a day. Cheaper when I got to Morocco, which is where I got this pipe, so we'll get right into the story there. This little bowl here, I'd like to take it off, but uh, it's taped on. This is a um, very nice little stone bowl, and it's carved. I don't know if you can see, you know, holding it upside down here. That says 70, there we go, Seven zero. I carved it and I spent a lot of hours sitting in my room, actually in Casablanca by this point. Bought it in Tangier and uh, used it in Casablanca. I didn't want to bring back any of my other pipes and paraphernalia back then, 1970, going through the border, but I cleaned out this bowl and saved it. So on the one side I've got 70 and on the bottom, oh, there is the bottom is very, very nice. It was Ken. Again, you can't see it because of the tape, but I carved out, you know, nice and 3D relief, Ken. And then on the other side, it says uh, Tangier, because that's where I got it. So Tangier, Morocco. So that was going to be my souvenir. Now, I got that home. I had to leave behind the beautiful wooden pipes that went with it. And when I was in Dublin, I bought another um, souvenir, and it was a tin whistle. That's what this is. A very nice little tin whistle. Of course, I never played it, but all the holes are taped over now. And I guess it didn't take me too long once I was home to realize, hey, if you take the tin whistle, sorry, I, I just keep, I gotta work on this camera angle a little bit. Um, I wanted you to see the, uh, the goose head this time. A little bit of uh, Christmas cheer here. Um, if I taped this up and taped the bowl to it, it gave a very nice long pipe. And it was very long, so it was a little cool because you're putting your bits of hash in there. Always there's a little bit of tin foil here with the holes poked in. And you're slicing up using that hash knife I showed you on the very first episode. Um, your bits of blonde lab, red lab, Afghani, Pakistani, Mor uh, Moroccan, what it, whatever type of uh, hash you had, putting it in that little bowl, and then you're taking a big long draw. And a lot of hash went through this pipe. My friends loved it, and this was the pipe. Uh, and my other friend, good friend Glenn, of course, had a water pipe, which was a better way to smoke. And when we went to his house, we sat around the water pipe. But anybody who visited me, or if we were out somewhere, I always packed along my hash knife. 
couldn't put a value on it now. It's got sentimental reason. I did, when I was in Ottawa, 1988 probably, I actually made a video. I had a very expensive Sony video camera. And I made a video, set it up on a stand, and um, I, I made something with the idea of if I, when I pass on, maybe somebody will find this video. And it was me lighting up this baby and then doing, um, you know, just a, a story, much the way I'm doing now, but that was 1988. So we're talking, uh, can I be right? 88? Yeah, yeah. What's that, 40 years ago? 88, 98, 2008? 30 years ago? You do the math. Here you are, Scarborough Dudes, hash pipe. I don't know what else to say about it other than uh, uh, this was a way of um, sharing with friends. This was our, our sacrament, our holy communion, our, uh, our gathering. This is what we did. Um, I, I, money was always tight in the old days, so what I would do is I would buy an ounce of hash, sell three quarters of it, and that covered the cost of the remaining quarter for myself. So buy, buy an ounce for whatever price, anywhere from 80 to 100 bucks, really, generally. And then you could sell a quarter for 25, but I wouldn't. I'd take the quarter and I'd cut it up into what we call nickels and dimes, $5 piece, $10 piece. Now, I didn't want to be known as a dealer. It was The deal was only friends, but I, I can remember a couple of times people would come to my house, my parents' house, and, um, you know, I remember one young lady, she had a creep of a boyfriend, but she wanted to get him a birthday present and didn't have much money, but could you, could you just sell me a nickel? And I'm like, go away, go, don't come to my house. Like, you know, who's that young girl out there? Uh, I mean, she wasn't so young, I guess we are 20, but still it was very uncomfortable. Uh, I probably did her a favor, um, but we tried not to. And then I guess eventually, I tried to keep it a secret from my friends, you know, and the people I was selling to, uh, where I was getting it. And then eventually some of these friends opened up and said, hey, I can get that stuff. How much do you want? You know, you want an ounce, quarter pound? And uh, that pretty well put me out of business, but uh, that was the end of it by then. Anyway, we moved to Vancouver and I guess that's when we switched over to grass. But uh, um, it meant a lot to me. I don't know why I still have it. I don't know what people will do with it. I suppose I could just take it apart. Um, or maybe, you know, clean it out and uh, reuse it. Now that we have legal weed here in uh, Ontario, I could probably, um, yeah, I could probably just put a little bit in that bowl right there and uh, try it out. I guess it's still a little bit blocked. I think I'm actually going to have to take it apart. So uh, there you go. Gosh, wasn't much to it. I Maybe I'll show, throw in a bonus, although I probably showed these in the match episode. These would have been the matches from Morocco, those wonderful little ones, little uh, wax things, tiny little things there. They Look at the size of that, just baby little matches. You'd strike that on the side. I don't think they work anymore, but... No, not after... Uh, they were going back. These would have been bought in 1970, so no, not much of a flame there. All right. Put that baby back. So that's all part of the story. I um, probably should add as a just a footnote, uh, Morocco, where I got this, was also where I did my first acid trip. So those of you who don't follow my podcast and don't know my history, I hung out with some uh, heavy-duty dope dealers. Uh, very, very good people, nice people. Uh, all the guy wanted was enough to make a down payment to buy a house when he got back to uh, British Columbia. Won't say where, won't give his name. He had a fake name. He acted like a real jerk. And then he explained to me once we were on the acid that, hey, I only act like a jerk, so I'm not going to get uh, noticed too much. He made himself look fat, and he uh, he was this time was with his wife. He had made quite a few trips. And he would just tape five kilos to his body and uh, get that back. And on the last trip, I mean, the last time I saw him, certainly it was a pretty fabulous acid trip. This guy was getting the real stuff. He knew who he was buying from and dealing with. Uh, that was my first, and, and to this day, I am grateful for that fellow. Uh, I'll save the story of that trip maybe for another time. I don't know if there's any artifacts to go with it, but uh, it is a good story. And um, so I never heard whether he made it back or what happened to him, and he's not the kind of guy, and I probably never knew his real name anyway, but... Uh, I thank him very much for that. Uh, he made a comment, I just do remember, just as another footnote here, 
uh, when we were smoking up and getting high, me and my traveling buddy, who was a, a runaway from England, um, he said, geez, you guys are still in the flower stage. And I took it as such an insult, you know, that, uh, hey, what are you putting me down for? And he said, no, no, I mean that, man. It's because you're happy and you're laughing and you're giggling. And I guess he had been at this game for a long time. And uh, it was a pretty serious chance he was taking because you had to leave Morocco, get back to Spain before you, uh, you made it home to Canada. And uh, he thought it was cool that we could just uh, laugh and giggle and have fun. And uh, we all stayed in the same pension in... Uh, in downtown, in downtown, in Tangier. That's where all the freaks hung out, so. All right, that's the story, 10 minutes. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, this will be the Scarborough Dude signing off, and uh, come back, keep checking the feed, subscribe if you can, and there'll be more stories coming from the uh, Scarborough Dude's Basement Museum Bar. Bye for now.